Hello, welcome to episode 79 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die, 1971's Two Lane Blacktop, directed by Monty Hellman. This is a film that to me is kind of an emblem of where America was during this period in the late 60s, the early 70s, uh, and that kind of freewheeling uh, theme of freedom. You know, films like Easy Rider as well kind of encapsulated that. And Two Lane Blacktop does kind of the same thing. It's a road movie. It's an open road movie and it's kind of this um i guess counterculture would be a way to describe it you know just this idea of of going out and just being that's the feeling that this film conveys to me and i've seen it before and i very much enjoyed watching it again and it has a very unique cast uh, we have james taylor uh, playing the lead character only known as the driver james taylor very big uh, singer songwriter in the rock and roll hall of fame he's won grammys and i believe this is the only film that he ever did he wasn't an actor but he did this film and he has a companion with him, they drive around the country in this 1955 car that looks like a piece of shit but they've tuned it up, they put a great engine in it and they travel across the US, uh, across Route 66, all that kind of stuff and they drag race um, for money and that's how they live, they just race and I, I love the, just the, again, the freewheeling kind of the feel of that, you know, just, just living life on the road just the way you want to do it and kind of just going day by day that there's something very appealing about that uh, especially for people like me who probably will never be in a situation like that there's this kind of escapism to it um and his his companion the mechanic who kind of works on the car and stuff is played by dennis wilson former uh, drummer of the beach boys so again we have a musician not an actor uh, and two musicians uh, as the kind of lead characters in the film they pick up a girl along the way played by laurie bird again known only as the girl Laurie Bird was an actress who did three films. Um, she has a very small appearance in uh, Annie Hall, uh, and then there's another film that she did, but this is kind of her main and only role that, uh, and the other film might be a bigger role, I don't know, but this is kind of, you know, it's a very small filmography. And so for these three main characters, uh, you put them in this film, and you put them in a film that is very much its own kind of thing. You can draw comparisons to Easy Rider, but Two Lane Blacktop is one of those kind of singular films where you have these three lead performances that you, you don't really see those actors do anything else again. And there's something special about that to me, like uh, Passion of Joan of Arc, uh, the 1920s version with... Um, I forget the actress's name now because there's varying, varying reports on what, what her name really was, but um, that's the only film she ever did. And there's something very um, special about that. Now, in the case of Laurie Bird, it's more haunting than it is special because she uh, took her life at a young age, um, committed suicide at the age of 26. She was 17, I believe, when she made Two Lane Blacktop. And her mother also uh, committed suicide at the age of 26. And so that there's this weird kind of uh, story there behind you know, the end of her life. And also, you know, uh, it kind of has that thing, like with other actors who have died young, uh, like say River Phoenix, you know, whenever I see a film from him, I kind of, it's, 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 it's has this haunting quality to it, knowing that he never really, you know, lived a long life. And the same thing goes with Laurie Birdhurst. Here, seeing her in this film, uh, it, it's just kind of like, wow, you know, to see this young person with, with her life ahead of her. There's even um, a screen test on the, uh, the Blu-ray. Uh, where they're just asking her questions, you know, just to see what her kind of personality is like. And they say, what's the best day of your life? And she's like, um, it hasn't happened yet, you know. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And it's just like, you know. Um, but, you know, again, this film stands alone because it has these performers who you never see in, in other films. It's, it's very singular. But then you have the fourth character, who is a more established actor. Uh, Warren Oates, who I'll always remember the most, is a hulker in Stripes. Um, brilliant. And he plays a guy called GTO. Again, he's named after the car that he drives. He doesn't have a name. Uh, and he kind of comes across the, this group of three just driving along the road, Route 66 and all that kind of stuff. And he comes across them at a gas stop. A really great tense scene where they're, where they're just kind of eyeing each other up and stuff. And he's drinking this bottle of Coke. And whenever I watch this film, I really want a bottle of Coke uh, for some reason. Just that cool kind of glass bottle shimmering as he's drinking it and stuff. Oh, I really want a bottle of Coke. Uh, and, and they basically decide to have a race together. And he's an older guy in this film. He's, uh, he looks kind of like late 40s, maybe, uh, maybe early 50s. And, uh, and he's doing the same thing that they're doing, but they're young people. You know, again, Laurie Bird was 17, you know, James Taylor, Dennis Wilson in their 20s, I, w I would imagine, or at least early 30s. They're young people, you know, with, with the road ahead of them, just kind of, um, just drifting. This is a drifting film. And Warren Oates' character, GTO, he's drifting too. 
um, but he's a middle-aged man. And so you get to see this kind of mid midlife crisis unfold and he becomes the fourth main character. You get so much more of him once he enters the film. Uh, and they decide to have a race because he's in this 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 nice looking yellow sports car GTO and he's like you know I can beat anyone in a race and they're like right let's have a country long race to Washington DC and whoever wins you know we're talking pink slips you know we will win the car and so they that's that's the rest of the film they go on this this country long race um, and they keep crossing paths again and you know they, they'll be antagonistic towards each other they'll kind of help each other out and I liked how it kind of went back and forth in that way there's a lot of stuff with the girl uh, and who between the driver and the mechanic is she going to sleep with and and maybe become an item with and there's kind of that love triangle going on and then once GTO gets involved there's kind of a, a love square you know uh, who's she going to go off with who is she going to place her allegiance with and who is she going to go off and and drift with to the next the next town you know the thing about this film um, I love the way that it's that it's not even the way that it's shot but just just the things that we see the open roads the gas stops you know the, the rest stops the the hotels you know the, the the drag race meets all that stuff it just it feels so alive with the spirit of what this film is trying to capture and that is that life on the road and um, I love road movies and this is one of my favorites uh, and I just love seeing all that stuff, seeing the, you know, the seeing America, you know, as they're driving through it. Um, there's something special about that. And then the film itself is very, very minimal. There'll be times where there's just no dialogue, you know, they're just hanging out, just driving or just fixing the engine, you know. I mean, it feels like you know, oh, they just didn't cut anything out and just left all these pregnant pauses in there. But it does feel very specifically. Um, you know, minimal, you know, there are moments where James Taylor, who people say he's not a very good actor, and, you know, certainly he didn't like the screen on fire, but um, he, he sometimes flubs his lines, and then he'll, he'll say, you know, da, da, uh, da, 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 you know, like, but it feels natural, you know, whether it was intentional, or whether he literally did flub his lines and just carried on, the director was like, I like that, I'm going to keep that in, I don't know, but it, it seemed to fit with me. Similarly with Laurie Bird, she wasn't a great actress, I don't feel, you know, certain moments there, they're not too good, but she, she felt natural. She felt like a kid on the road who didn't really know what she was doing. You know, she's trying to appear like she does. Oh, yeah, I was driving with this guy and he was smoking joints and stuff. And, you know, yeah, you kind of get this feeling that you're not buying what she's saying, you know, what she's got to offer. And so, but I think that works for the character. And so you just have these guys driving and and just talking you know and I'm not talking you know there, there's the silences between the conversations that that seem to say more than the conversations do at times you know and a lot of the key key moments of the film where the characters splinter off or they you know they make a decision are those moments are made without it being vocalized you know like right I'm going to go off with him now you know right we're, we're going to leave you here anything like that no it, it would just happen a lot of the times and uh, Warren Oates, I think, was just brilliant in the film. Uh, you see him kind of pick up a lot of people along the way as they're racing to Washington, D.C. He'll pick up hitchh hitchhikers and stuff. And, and I love how he's always telling these stories. And, and by the end of the film, you, you truly realize that he is he's almost as lost as the young men that he's, he's racing with in life. You know? And I, I loved how that character unfolded um, and the lies. That he, and he's just blagging, basically. But he's so perfect and smooth at it, you know. Uh, which is just really enjoyable to watch. There's a great little cameo from Harry Dean Stanton uh, as a kind of uh, homosexual hitchhiker who gets in the car with Warren Oates. Kind of a funny moment there where he puts his hand on his leg and he's like, what you doing? Oh, I thought maybe it would relax you. And he's just like, nope, I'm racing these boys. I ain't got no time, you know? <laughs> I love that that was his reaction. He was just like, I ain't got no time. <laughs> uh, there's funny moments in it, but it's, you know, it's, it's certainly a film to just put on and relax to. It's not a very dynamic film in terms of drama, um, but there are some tense moments, you know. Um, it throws in different things, and um, I just think that as as a film that seeks to capture the spirit of what it is, again, life on the road, that kind of, you know, freedom, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and uh, and kind of living off your own kind of whatever. You know what I'm talking about. I've kind of beleaguered the point at this point, so... Tulane Blacktop, is it a film you must see before you die? Um, yeah, I think it is. I think it is a film you must see before you die. If Easy Rider is up there, uh, then I certainly think that Tulane Blacktop deserves to be in the conversation for films like this. And I think it is, it is uh, important when a film can capture a certain part of, of you know, the human psyche. 
and this is part of the human psyche is that you know why don't I just get in my car and just drive you know um, just see where the road takes me and see what life brings to me uh, when I got nothing planned and I'm living day to day uh, and this film just really sums up that that whole thing perfectly to me uh, I love the end of the film uh, and there, there are moments there where you know James Taylor and Dance Wilson they, they do have these kind of moments of not brilliance but you know um, very good moments I would say you know where it's like that's kind of cool especially the ending like James Taylor's face during the ending of the film uh, really sums up everything his character is going through and he, d he says so little it almost harkens to uh, I guess it would be 10, 20, 40 years later with uh, uh, Drive you know Brian Gosling's character the driver you know uh, I wouldn't say there's, there's many similarities but certainly a character who doesn't say much and is known as just the driver has that kind of that kind of uh, aura of cool about him, and you're always wonder, wondering what is he, what is that guy thinking, what is going on inside his head, and I get that with James Taylor. You know, I'm thinking, what, what is he thinking, especially in that last shot of the film when he's driving, and it's like, what is he thinking there? There's so much behind the eyes, and I want to know. And so that is one of those performances where you can project onto it, and you can kind of make up your own story, make up your own even personality inside your head. Who is he? What really makes him tick? It's up to you. You know, it's up to you to make that up for yourself, judging by the things that he does in the film, or, you know, there's so many variables, but I love when characters are that minimal, but not minimal to the point where you get nothing out of it. I think that you can glean stuff from his performance, in my opinion. Anyway, I think it is a film we see before you die, because it's an interesting film, it's a different kind of film, and again, it sums up a certain uh, feeling uh, perfectly. So there we go. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you've seen the film, let me know your thoughts down below, and I'll see you in the next video. In fact, tomorrow will be the beginning of Horror Month on the Epic Film Challenge 2. We're going to be doing 31 horror reviews every single day in the month of October 2016. So I hope you join me for that. Uh, and if you're watching this way after the fact, then hey, there were 31 horror reviews coming after this video. So there you go. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.